Welcome to the uh, October 27th meeting of the uh, Newport Beach City Council. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. All right. We'll go out to public comment. Do we have any public comment at this time? Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill, members of the City Council. This is Jim Mosier speaking from the community room. Uh, according to the agenda, I see you're about to meet privately to evaluate the performance of three, the three employees that you hire, apparently with 10 minutes for each. According to their contracts, that evaluation might include a discussion by you of the objectives that you have set for them, although you don't share with the public whether you have set any objectives for them or not. What I wanted to suggest is that although you hire these three folks, in a sense they work for the whole public that you represent. So in completing their evaluation, you might want to consider making a greater effort to ask how the public feels that these three employees perform for them. I leave that to you to figure out what is the best way to get that input because I suspect that this is not the best forum for candid, candid public comment on their performance, uh, especially at four in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Do we have any calls? Okay. Hi, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Hello? Hi, yes, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tracy Blankenship, and I am the uh, managing agent for Newport Ridge Estates in the uh, Newport Coast Master Plan community. Go ahead. Okay. I am calling on behalf of residents that reside in the community. We are the managing agent for the development. And there is concern regarding a street that is adjacent to the community, which is Terrace Ridge. Terrace Ridge is a city street, and therefore the uh, ordinances in the area allow for parking of vehicles to remain for often days at a time and in a, in a way that affects the residents and impacts their quality of life. They have voiced concerns to us and asked us to speak on their behalf to urge the city to um, conduct a survey of the area to determine if the municipality of that particular street may be changed. In, um, for example, maybe that they would prohibit or restrict parking for certain time periods and maybe disallow. Overnight parking would be one option or to consistently patrol the area to ensure that vehicles don't remain stored in that area. There are often recreational vehicles, boats with trailers, construction vehicles, and cars that are left there for more than 72 hours and um, somewhat abandoned in nature. And they remain there during street sweeping time periods, so the street sweeping isn't even effective. At this time, the residents of that community are asking the city council to um, review this matter and determine if something can be done which will aid in uh, maintaining the character of the neighborhood. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any other callers? All right, uh, Mr. Harp. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. The City Council will adjourn to closed session to discuss item 3A, the performance review of the City Manager, City Attorney, and City Clerk. Thank you. All right, we'll recess until 4.30. Thank you. All right, welcome back to the uh, October 27, 2020 City Council meeting. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Mr. Harvard, do we have a closed session report? Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. There's no closed session report this evening. All right, uh, at this time, we'll have the invocation by Councilmember Muldoon and Pledge of Allegiance by Councilmember Dixon. Uh, please stand through both. Thank you. 
Uh, please join us in prayer if you so choose. Heavenly Father, uh, there are many things going on in the world right now. Tonight, we lift up in prayer our first responders, firefighters, and our displaced neighbors. We ask for your divine protection over them and over their homes. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start, uh, first start with the, procl uh, the proclamation designating November 8th, 8th through 14th, 2020 is National Nurse Practitioner Week. Uh, if we have a representative from that, that will receive this in our community room, I uh, just want to note real quickly for everyone who is joining us in the community room, due to the air quality, we've closed the doors. So uh, we can't see you from here, but we can see you on a live uh, video feed right in front of us. Um, so if, you, if we do have someone here, I will make sure that our city clerk uh, runs out and, and gives you the proclamation and then uh, again if you if you're here uh, in the community room I'll give you an opportunity to speak as well so whereas nurse practitioners serve as trusted frontline providers of health care for patients in California and whereas nurse practitioners are advanced practice uh, are advanced practice registered nurses who have advanced clinical education and training building upon their initial registered nurse preparation and there are 200, 270,000 licensed nurse practitioners in the United States providing primary, acute, and specialty care to patients of all ages and walks of life. And whereas nurse practitioners diagnose, treat, and prescribe medications and other treatments to patients through a caring, patient-centered, holistic model of care, and whereas citizens of our state and nation have great trust in the high-quality care nurse practitioners provide, resulting in over 1 billion patients, patient visits annually to nurse practitioners across the country, and whereas five decades of research demonstrates the high quality of care provided by nurse practitioners, and whereas leading government, governmental and policy entities, including the National Academy of Medicine, National Council of State Boards of Nursing, National Governors Association, and Federal Trade Commission have taken notice of the benefits of nurse practitioner full practice authority and have endorsed such a regulatory model, and whereas the city of Newport Beach is proud to recognize and honor the service of nurse practitioners to our state. Now, therefore, I, Will O'Neill, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire City Council, to hereby proclaim the week of November 8th through 14th, 2020, as Nurse Practitioner Week here in the City of Newport Beach. Do we uh, do we have any representative in? Oh, we do. Yes. Fantastic. Go right ahead. Hi. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill and City Council members of Newport Beach. My name is Catherine Roy. I am a resident of Newport Beach, a practicing NP and board member of the Orange County chapter of the California Association for Nurse Practitioners. I am very grateful to receive this proclamation on behalf of CANP and would like to thank all the NPs and healthcare providers for the work they do. This recognition means so much to us, especially during Year of the Nurse 2020 and during increased work demands from COVID-19. Nurse practitioners are celebrating the signing of AB 890 into law which removes supervisory requirements for NPs starting 2023. CNP and over 80 coalition partners are proud to help close the healthcare provider gap and continue to heal the communities we serve. California joins 22 other states in bolstering its number of providers in areas of critical healthcare shortage. Thank you as well for the support you give the city during this unprecedented time. We are all in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll make sure you get the proclamation in just a moment. All right, uh, we'll move into our next item, which is a presentation from the Newport Beach Library Foundation. Mr. Hetherington. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Mayor O'Neill and members of the council. I'm here tonight with, uh, with Mrs. Karen Clark of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. She's the chair and she'd like to make a few comments. I'm also here with trustee uh, Paul Watkins. I come bearing money. <laughs> My favorite, go ahead. Uh, so good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill and members of the city council. I'm Karen Clark, chair of the board of directors of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. Um, as you probably know, the Newport Beach uh, Library Foundation has been around for almost 30 years, uh, funding 
valuable resources and programs to the public library. Um, our support has helped make our library the exceptional library that it is, known throughout the city, the county, and even the state for its um, outstanding services. Um, in just over the past 10 years, the foundation has donated in programming and resources over $7 million to the library. Um, so this afternoon, I'm pleased to bring a very conventional looking check <laughs> for uh, the sum of $88,000, which we will add to the $7 million that we've given over the last 10 years. Um, and this year, this money will go to, uh, to fund several valuable library collections, um, some of the e-content, the downloadable e-content, and subscription databases, which are getting more and more important. Um, and finally, kind of as an aside, I feel I need to recognize and pay tribute to one of the founders of the foundation, John Starr. As you all know, he passed away earlier this month. Uh, he and Elizabeth were a driving force in creating the foundation and making it a su the success that it is. So um, we wish to publicly honor him. Um, so on behalf of the foundation, I thank you all for your support of the library. We certainly appreciate it, and it has made our library the exceptional and magnificent hometown library that it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, let's see, we'll go next to Paul, Mr. Watkins. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Paul Watkins. I'm the chair of the Board of Library Trustees, and I'm the biggest cheerleader of the library. And I cheer particularly loudly for the foundation. Uh, this donation, as Karen indicates, will allow us to do a lot of uh, digital and, and uh, other resourcing. It's an amazing uh, group. Uh, led by Karen. She has a great support staff, and I just want to thank her and the foundation board and, of course, the city. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, are you going to say anything? Nope? Okay. Um, thank you. This, this, is a, this is a really big deal, um, and every time you come in to donate and uh, help our library system, it means a lot. Uh, this year in particular, you're right, it's been, it's been a real slog to figure out how to get materials in people's hands and uh, to Mr. Heatherton and his staff's uh, great credit. I think they led the county, frankly, in the way that they handled uh, library circulation uh, and made sure that the online resources that you've helped provide have been better used and better understood uh, during this year. So, uh, and I can tell you in my family, or my little ones uh, certainly appreciated the online resources. So, I, and I just wanna say thank you very much for all that you've done for our community. Well, we know, Mayor, that you're one of our biggest supporters and we, oh. we really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll take that check and cash it very quickly, so. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think the bank will honor this? <laughs> I, I think we can find a bank, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. All right. Uh, we'll move into uh, City Council announcements and oral reports from City Council on committee activities. Uh, let's see, I'll start left to right in our traditional way, finally. So we'll start with Mr. Herdman. Thank you. <coughs> so where's Jeff been and what has Jeff been doing? Uh, I attended the monthly Orange County Vector Control Board of Trustees meeting, and I want to go a little bit more into uh, um, detail regarding the uh, Vector Control Board of Trustees, uh, there have been 13 cases of West Nile virus reported in the county this season. There's been one death, uh, and there has been three bird deaths, uh, 38 bird deaths, excuse me. I think you know that mosquitoes carry the West Nile disease. There have been none, no cases reported in Newport Beach. There have been three cases of West Nile in Costa Mesa and one in Irvine. Uh, there's been no typhus reported. Um, we have had uh, <clears throat> quite an influx of what's called uh, ankle biters uh, in, our, in our city, and not only just in our city, but in South Orange County. Um, vector control is spraying for these. 
However, uh, uh, spraying is, is a, a Band-Aid approach because after spraying, they're back after about two days. Um, if you're having a uh, um, particular difficult time with ankle biters, you can always call Vector Control for an inspection and they will come out and help. Uh, there were 43 service calls in our city this past month, 41 for mosquitoes and one for red fire ants. Um, acres of flood channels that were treated in our city this month were 5.4, and there were 1,760 adult mosquitoes collected this month in our city. Um, the county average uh, is at a 4.0, and that is considered a high risk uh, level for the county in terms of uh, mosquito infestation and uh, problems caused by that. The Aviation Committee uh, met yesterday. <clears throat> However, over the past month, uh, subcommittees, our, our various subcommittees have been, have been meeting and yesterday they reported out their work at the committee meeting. The technical departure uh, committee uh, continues to work on uh, takeoff profiles that result in the quietest possible takeoffs. More work is being done in that area. Government relations is uh, working on uh, kind of a secret project. They didn't seem to want to reveal it last night. Uh, but I know what they're working on, but I, I, I better not say anything because I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but they are hard at work on, on developing a program for general aviation at this point, uh, and we'll be hopefully presenting it to the larger committee at our next meeting. And the Communication Outreach Committee is working on developing educational ads related to the airport to educate the community. We had a legislative update from our sh lobbyist, Shannon Hanna, uh, presentation by our uh, consultant Kevin Carpe on regulation and management of airspeed, airspace, and aircraft speeds. And then Nick Gaskins from the Access and Noise Department uh, presented an update on the new General Aviation Improvement Program, where the county is regarding that. And then I provided an update on our recent meetings with the FAA and Grace an update on meetings with the air carriers. So uh, a very active committee. Uh, in fact, the suggestion uh, was even made last night that we consider making the Aviation Committee a part of the city charter as well as the Harbor Commission since the airport's gonna be around forever and it's gonna have an impact on our community forever. Uh, Joy and I met with Harbor Commissioner uh, Bill Kenny on an agenda item tonight and then uh, I attended our, our monthly airport update meeting with staff. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I too was uh, as Vice Chair of Aviation, so I attended that excellent meeting yesterday and that was an excellent recap. Uh, the Balboa Village Advisory Committee met a week ago and uh, we're looking at, we're going to be doing a walk around through Balboa Village I think in the next two weeks, uh, then to be followed by our, our next meeting and looking at uh, the impacts that are happening with the continued high season visitor activity in Balboa Village and the restroom situation, the sidewalk uh, cleaning situation. Uh, we op the city operates, city services operates on an off season mode now, which is typically the right, uh, the right thing to do, uh, but it seems that many people are still coming to our community and enjoying our beach, which is great because it's free, uh, but there's also a lot of maintenance that needs to be taken care of. So that seems, that is the number one issue, maintenance at Balboa Village. Uh, last Thursday, I'm sure the mayor will, and uh, others may speak about the police award ceremony that was held at long overdue after it had to be canceled last March because of COVID. So it was at the Sheriff's Training Academy over in Tustin. I'll let the mayor speak to that, but it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to salute our, uh, essentially the Medal of Valor uh, of our police, or the valor activities of our police officers. So it was a very proud moment to recognize. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, Mayor. I also met with uh, Harbor Commissioner Bill Kenny to talk about tonight's item. 
attended a police appreciation event as well, and it's an odd setup. The front of the room was the entrance, so I walked in during the national anthem, so I walked out, walked to the other side. Then I walked in during Mayor Will's speech, so I walked out, <laughs> walked to the other side. But it was, aside from my uh, uh, antics, it was such an honorable event. Great job, Chief Lewis, and great job to your men and women in your department, volunteers and sworn, who will serve our community so well. Uh, if you're watching from home, you might notice these partitions. These are put in here by staff, thank you very much, They're to keep us safe, but also it's to emulate a show I used to love called Hollywood Squares. Mm. Um, you ask a B actor if they think, you know, they know the answer to the question, and we are those B actors, so uh, appreciate that, staff. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Ms. Brenner. I keep telling Council Member Muldoon that he needs to take his show on the road because he's got a career in comedy, so. Um, let's see, so I attended the CDM Residents Association board meeting. I also attended the CDM Residents Association historical subcommittee meeting, and that is our group that's looking at the historical resources within Corona Del Mar, our cottages and our historical sites that we'd like to get recognized. Um, and we also invited all the other members of, of groups in the community who are working on preserving our history to come and meet with us at Sherman Gardens. And Ed Olin from the city staff came and he filmed a PSA with each of those people talking about what they do to preserve our history. And we're hoping to put together a little public service announcement on Newport Beach TV telling people how we are taking care to remember our history and honor it. And we want everyone to know that when they're cleaning out their garages or when they are cleaning out the estate of an aging parent or whatever, that um, there is a place in the community where the memorabilia, the photographs, that sort of thing will be cared for. We. Um, Paul Wormser at Sherman Library will scan any sort of photographs that anyone has that is significant to the history of Newport Beach, and we can get that into our files. And uh, the Balboa Island Museum has a wonderful place where they will take artifacts, and the Newport Beach Historical Society at our library on Balboa Peninsula has more artifacts that they preserve down there. Um, and we really just want people to know that we honor our past and we want to make sure that we have a place for it. So that's one thing we've been working on. I also attended the Corona de Mar bid meeting and they are working diligently on, um, since we can't do the Corona de Mar Christmas walk this year, we're going to do Christmas month in Corona del Mar and they're planning all sorts of activities that will be pop-up activities. So there will not be opportunities for people to plan ahead and gather all in one spot, but there will be activities throughout the month so that there's going to be window decorating contests, there's gonna be lighting contests, there's going to be different sorts of things, uh, pop-up art shows and pop-up music and that sort of thing so that there will be a reason for people to spend as much time as possible on the highway during the month of December. And I'm hoping to do, get the Residents Association to do a light up Corona Del Mar event so that we get um, perhaps a little bit more festive decoration in the village than we've had in the past because driving around looking at Christmas lights is a COVID free activity. So we, um, we hope to really do some great things in that area. So those are the majority of my activities. I do have um, an A1 item that I'd like to um, discuss waiving all city fees for the proposed expansion of the pre-primary school at the Community Church Congregational, located at 611 Heliotrope in Corona Del Mar. There's the sweetest little school there that, in my opinion, lowers the blood pressure by just entering the doors. And there is a precedent for this because it was done for the preschool at the Environmental Nature Center, so I'd like to A1 that for a future discussion. Um, the other thing I do need to mention is that there's trick-or-treating happening at the businesses in Corona Del Mar on March, is it March? On November the 30th or 31st, I had it pulled up, but I had to change it here, so. Probably October. October, that's it, that's the right month. And um, what the businesses are doing, if they have a flyer in their window talking about the scavenger hunt, then they have candy available for the kids. You can pick up 
a uh, pass, a scavenger passport at Magna Magnasium, and then go around to the different businesses and get things marked off. That goes from 10 to 5. And um, I believe also our Newport Beach police are passing out candy this year, too. So that's, that's it. All right. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Duffield. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, all I have is I'd like to lodge a no vote on item oh, four. Hang on one second. That's, we'll come back to that. Oh, sorry. That's consent. Uh, this is just uh, right point. now we're just talking about city council announcements. Uh, well, then I would announce that it's quite odd sitting in this cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Mayor Pro Tem Avery Thank now. you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended, uh, along with yourself and uh, Ms. Renner, the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness meeting, and uh, it was actually, um, well, I shouldn't say actually, but it was, uh, for me, we had a really nice discussion with our uh, incredible volunteers in that committee, and also with Natalie. Um, and out of that came, I believe, which we'll see, we'll hear later, is an update uh, on the uh, our homeless strategy. So just getting the word out um, about just really the incredible work that's been going on, and it's just really important to communicate this because I know some members of the community say, well, you know, I don't see what's what's happening here, and uh, actually a lot's happening, and it's just a tremendous effort going on all the time. So uh, I look forward to to that report, and I also had the honor of attending the police uh, ceremony for uh, the valor and, and uh, smarts and bravery of our officers. Um, it was um, a really, really nice award ceremony over at the Sheriff's Academy in, in uh, Huston, I believe. Um, and it just, uh, it, it just reminded me of what a special force we have and the individuals that are in it that risk their lives um, and have saved lives um, it was compelling to me and I'm sure to everybody there and the families were there um, it's just it's so important to recognize um, heroic actions by the people that uh, protect us thank you thank you all right uh, I was able to meet with our Newport Beach Realtors uh, via zoom about the state of the city uh, we had a Corona Del Mar Residents Association meeting um, I actually uh, got in interviewed by CBS LA they wanted to talk about the Lakers winning the championship and what that meant to our city given uh, the loss of nine members of our community, two of which were um, in the Bryant family. Uh, we had a, uh, I took a tour of Lion Air Museum, um, just to, it was, it, they're not gonna have this, this year they won't have their Newport Mesa Unified School District uh, um, field trips, so I, I decided I'd at least go in as a representative. We had, um, as mentioned, we had our police awards. So that's been covered. I'm going to just say thank you very much um, to the chief and to our chamber for hosting a great uh, awards ceremony. And then uh, since it's already been covered, I'm, just, I'm going to switch over and just say thank you again to our police department and our fire department and all of our other departments that made a presidential visit work smoothly. Um, that is a big deal. And I think we got something around 72 hours notice or so. Um, and being able to pull that much together and coordinate with that many government agencies, it's a big deal. So to everyone who made that happen safely and securely here in the city of Newport Beach, I'd like to say thank you. And finally, um, fires. So uh, I want to say thank you to our fire chief for keeping everyone updated, um, to our fire PIO, and then um, to our city PIO, making sure that everyone out in the community knows where the fires are and how it's affecting um, our city and then our cities around us. Real quick update, uh, we had, yesterday we actually had fire, five fire trucks outside the city. Uh, two of them went to Anaheim to help backfill while they, were, the, while they were pulling in firefighters in that area, and three went to the fire. Um, so we still have three crews, I assume. Yep, we still have three crews on the fire. Uh, the fire, as of, gosh, an hour ago, was about 5% contained. Um, the fire up in uh, the area of Yorba Linda has uh, exploded. Um, and so it's, they're both uh, enormous, enormous fires right now. And unfortunately, yesterday we had two Orange County Fire Authority firefighters uh, suffer severe burns and be taken uh, straight to the hospital where they still are. So uh, we, yesterday, the city of Newport Beach, um, I reached out to Irvine's mayor and Irvine's mayor pro tem and made sure to offer anything that we, that they needed from the city of Newport Beach. 
Um, they uh, took us up on that offer and, and asked us to open up the Newport Coast Community Center to accept in residents from the city of Irvine. Uh, they have now, over the last 24 hours, there have been over 100,000 people who have been under evacuation orders here in Orange County. Um, every hotel room in, Orange, in Newport Beach was full last night. Uh, our Newport Coast Community Center was full last night. I went over and spoke to every family there. And uh, just a quick side note, I spoke to a family of five where the mother was, um, is, is an ER nurse over at Hogue. And uh, when I chatted with her and just kind of made sure they were okay, uh, she said, well, what can I be doing to help out the other people around? Um, and I said, why don't you just take care of your family and we'll take care of you for now. Um, that's the kind of spirit that we saw yesterday. And uh, so I just want to say in particular to our Recreation Senior Services Department, Thank you for um, getting the Newport Coast Community Center open so quickly and taking care of our neighbors in Irvine. All right, with that, uh, we'll move into matters with ca which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. Um, the first item is consideration of a zoning code amendment to allow restaurant and health club uses in the MUDW mixed use Dover Drive West Cliff area. Uh, if you'd like to see this brought back, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand. That was unanimous. And then the second is a discussion of traffic calming measures in Dover Shores. If you'd like to see that brought back, please raise your hand. That was also unanimous. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, go ahead. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items 1 through 13. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each of the items for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right, um, I'll preface this because we've got an item on here that's gotten a little bit of attention. I'll preface this by saying that to my fellow council members, um, I will be keeping track of the yeas and nays on each one. If for some reason I believe that there would be one that would um, uh, have four nays, I would pull before I would say nay. So that's just a simple encouragement not to pull any items tonight. Um, I'll, we'll, uh, we'll start with Mr. Herdman. Yeah, I'd like to pull item number three. And then uh, I need some clarification on item 13. The agenda item reads that the $88,000 check that was donated by the Library Foundation will be spent on maintenance and operations, but the staff report says it'll be spent on collections and programs. So uh, I need clarification on that, and I think the public needs clarification on it as well. Thank you. All right, since he's seeking clarification instead of pulling it, Mr. Heatherton, why don't you come up and provide that clarification? Uh, thanks very much. It's definitely going towards uh, collections and resources. I think the way the staff report is worded in that, that's the budget line it goes to, and um, it goes to the operating budget, and we use that to fund the purchase of, uh, in those cases, it's e-content and databases. Okay, good. Thank you, Tim. I knew that, but I just didn't want the public to be confused. Thank you. All right, Ms. Dixon. I have no items. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon. I'd like to lodge a no vote on item number four. Uh, Ms. Brenner. Um, I'd like clarification on the um, item number four from Aaron. Um, Aaron, could you, um, what I, if, if we were to pull this, I would like us to discuss the transferability um, part of this ordinance. And if it's accepted, um, I'd like to A1 the transferability issue for a future council meeting. Can you explain how that would work? Um, so that we would, if we could amend our ordinance, if we chose, if we looked more in depth at the transferability issue and decided that there were any changes we wanted to make? Uh, sure, so it's on the calendar tonight for second reading. 
So if it's adopted, it'd be adopted as it, assuming there's no changes. But you're always free to come back and look at any provision that's adopted by the city council in an ordinance format and uh, make changes there too. Um, the one issue is this will be going to Coastal at some point, so you might eventually need to get their approval um, if you made changes to the transferability. But uh, you are welcome to come back and, and look at any, any provision of the municipal code to make changes there too. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Duffield. I'd like to lodge a no vote on item four. Okay, Mr. Avery. All right, and then um, I will be lodging a no vote on item number four. So um, I told you I'd keep track. Um, so item three has been pulled, but I want to note for members of the public and for council up here that currently um, item number four would pass if uh, adopted uh, four to three with uh, council members Dixon, Herdman, Brenner, and Avery uh, voting yes. So um, I'm, I note that because I wanted to make sure that folks when they went out to public comment, understood what I was saying there. And if uh, they could keep comments short on a second reading that is apparently four to three right now on a passage, I would greatly appreciate that. But anyway, Mr. Avery, do you have a motion? Yes, I do, uh, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move the balance of the consent calendar items one through 13 with the exception of the following items. Uh, Item three, pulled by Councilman Herdman. And uh, Councilman Herdman, did you have comments on 13? No, he sought clarification. It was okay. Yeah. Uh, no, no, nothing pulled by Councilmember Dixon. Item four, um, a no vote by Councilmember Muldoon. Uh, a no vote by Mayor O'Neill on item four. And a no vote um, on uh, item four by Councilmember Duffield. All right, do we have a second? Second by Mr. Muldoon. And um, amendments to the And amendments to item one, sorry. Yes. Amendments to item number one. Okay. All right, uh, we're gonna, we will go out to public comment on this item. I would, again, remind everyone that this is a second reading on item four. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm saying we have to go out to public comment on all of the items. Yeah, so I was just reminding, reminding folks. All right, so uh, we'll start in the community room. Uh, go ahead. My brother's wife just died. Her funeral is this Saturday at the First Evangelical Church. The Bible, Hebrews 9.27 tells us, all men will die, and after this comes judgment. At your funeral... I pray your children and grandchildren can say, I'm really proud of my dad. My dad lived his life the way Christ taught us, love one another and do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Even though there is a lot of money coming from businesses like short-term rental industry, my dad didn't sell his soul like Judas did to Jesus for silver and gold. My dad isn't like Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who tried to wash his hands of the decision. My dad voted his own conscience and not what other council members wanted him to do. City councils from Washington, D.C., New York, to San Francisco, L.A., Santa Monica, are now putting restrictions on short-term rentals to end the harm they are causing. You don't need to be reminded of all the problems they are causing in Newport Beach. 16 complaints in one month in my neighborhood alone. Like the lady in tears because she had to send her granddaughter back to San Francisco for safety reasons. A short-term rental next to her was dealing drugs. Everyone was eventually arrested. Or the lady and her daughter who spent sleepless nights all summer long because of partying short-term rentals. One time the police came when she called, but after they left, the party continued. She called the police again, they did not respond. She went over and asked if they could keep it down. She had work and her daughter had school in the morning. They threatened her. She was in tears when friends told her to call them next time. They would take care of it. But we don't need vigilante justice. Protect residents by doing what city councils all across our great country 
are doing by voting for regulations on short-term rentals. We just need each of you to do your job so you can look your family in the eyes and they can be proud of you. May God help you live in peace. May you help others live in peace and be safe. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, uh, this is Jim Mosier. Regarding item four on the consent calendar, I, note, I noticed the note above the consent calendar says that the items there are considered routine. And I would think if you have such dissension and division of opinion on the city council, it really does not belong on the consent calendar. It apparently is not routine. But that is not the item I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about item number nine and I don't in any way want to denigrate the fine work that is done by our fire paramedics, uh, but item nine is a million dollar proposal to replace our entire reserve fleet of ambulances, of which there are three. The thing, I, I would hope that the council would seek some clarification of this that is not, as far as I could tell, present in the staff report. We have a city council policy that expects that we get 12 years of service out of ambulances, eight years of service in daily use, and another four years as a reserve vehicle, where in reserve they can go well over 100,000 miles. It's been our experience in the past that we got 12 or more years life out of each ambulance. Here we're being re asked to replace an entire fleet that was purchased and put into service just seven years ago, not 12, and which currently is just barely at 100,000 miles. That suggests that this model of ambulance is not, it's not providing the level of performance that we got from ambulances in the past. And yet the proposal is to buy three more of the same model from the same company. Uh, the staff report does not explain why we're replacing them before the 12 years? Are they broken down? And if they are broken down, why would we buy, be buying more? So I could not find the answers to any of that in the staff report, and I hope you will inquire. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good day, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Nancy Scarborough. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the ad hoc committee for on the um, short-term lodging um, ordinance and the m four members, council members who voted yes for it tonight. Um, I am in support of that ordinance going forward. On consent ca uh, calendar item number nine, I'm aware that the city council policy F9 regarding the purchase of the replacement fire apparatus. I note that the mileage expectancy is 100,000 miles I see on purchase agreement item 60.2 and 60.3 that the body is warranted for 15 years and warranted for an additional five years if the body is removed and placed on a new chassis by an approved vendor. The body manufacturer is a Southern California company, so this is feasible. I wonder if the council has considered reusing these bodies and installing them on a new chassis when the service life of the chassis is reached. At 370, 300, $27,000, $1,000 per unit. I think this is worth exploring. The body is the major component, co major cost component. The chassis is about $88,000. So there's a substantial savings in a situation where we are trying to watch our budget closely. Thank you. Nancy, sorry, could you stay up for a second? Yes. Which, which pages were you talking about there? This was uh, consent item nine. Do you, do you know which? Sorry, which page is on the consent calendar item number nine? Because I'll, I'll call the fire chief up to, to address that. Um, on That's okay. If you, if you remember. 9-18. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Go to the uh, next speaker, please. Honorable Mayor and City Council, I'm Nancy Alston, and I want to thank you for voting um, in favor of the short-term rental ordinance. Um, 
I don't want to prolong this, but there was a long discussion, I thought, at a previous council meeting about enforcement. Now, I researched short-term rentals, and I finally got it down to six pages, but I actually could have written a master's thesis on it. But enforcement is the key, so maybe I should come back at a later time and talk about that. But I live in a section of the bluffs that um, we have seven associations in the bluffs. Most people think it's just one, but there are seven. And our president, who is in charge of parking, is a former high school principal. And I think that's about what you need because we don't allow people to park uh, in driveways or uh, in guest parking overnight unless you have a pass. And if you do those things, you get sued. I mean, you get towed, and you get towed immediately. And I think there was a discussion about, does anybody ever get towed anymore? Well, you do in our neighborhood. And I am a close, close friend of hers. And yet one night uh, when we were remodeling an office, we overstayed our uh, pass by one night, and we were towed, and that was $300, and uh, we had to go to the other side of Irvine and pick up our car, and I certainly learned my lesson. So I don't understand why we cannot tow people who cause problems from short-term rentals. So maybe we should talk about enforcement at some other time, Although I will conclude by saying that I really don't think that should be a function of the police. I think code enforcement should have that power to do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I, I think we've talked about enforcement often. I'm sure we will again. We'll next go to the next speaker, please. Do we have any more in the community room? All right. We'll go to the phones. Get out of here. All right, well, I'm, I'm not gonna waste any time. All right, uh, we'll pull it back up, up here then. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what? You know what, that's okay. I'm gonna call the chief up afterward anyway to, let's, let's go ahead and vote. I still want a clarification on that. That's a, it's an interesting point. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for item four, ordinance number 2020-26, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending portions of chapter 5.95 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code relating to short-term lodging. The motion carries unanimously 7-0. Um, Chief, are you, would you be prepared to, to speak to that public comment on the chassis or would you like you know, to talk to someone else in procurement or something? Are you prepared? Okay. All right. Just come on up. I think it. I think it's an interesting point worth uh, worth just mentioning. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Jeff Boyles, Fire Chief. I believe she brought up on Section Nine Sixteen regarding the chassis, and she is correct. The eighty-eight thousand um, dollars. That includes the the. Um, the taper suspension, the brake systems, and all the things that we're replacing. I think what's important to point out, as Mr. Moser brought up, the three medic vans that we'll be replacing are from, um, they're, they're a different manufacturer altogether. So the three that from the 2013, and I'm trying to find my notes here, we're replacing what we call the Leader International. It's a different chassis and a different ambulance box altogether. And the, uh, the freight liners are what we're moving towards in our city yard, our vehicle uh, replacement, and our mechanics are the ones that order the parts and do the bulk of the work on those from a mechanic standpoint. So it's their recommendation as the 2013 ambulances reach their lifespan on the 100,000 mile mark that we remove those out. And also, I think it's also important to point out that it takes about a year for these to be delivered. So they're at the seven year, eight year mark right now. And the ones on the 2013 end are bumping up at over the 100,000 mile mark. So that's where the decision was made to just replace that whole fleet. Interesting. I, I think at some point we're gonna uh, take another look at A14 anyway, so we can talk a little bit more at that point, but that's, that's an interesting point. Thanks, Chief. All right, um, real quick, uh, Council Member Dixon has asked me to, to come back around real quick to um, uh, 
uh, reopen item 12 so she can uh, place an A1 on the agenda. So go ahead, Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it just occurred to me when um, Nancy Alston was talking about enforcement, I would like to A1 uh, council discussion to hear from staff on how we could look at the current code, municipal code related to short-term rentals and enforcement and how we can tighten uh, the current provisions as we're now exploring new ways to enforce quality of life and safety in our neighborhoods. Uh, I think that there are aspects of our municipal code regarding enforcement of the code that can be uh, administratively tightened up. So I'd like to hear that back from staff at a future date, please. Thank you. Would you also, Ms. Brenner? Do I need to officially ask that we A1 the discussion on transferability? How do, how do we? Yes, you do. Okay, I'd like to A1 that as well so that we can flush it out and make sure we understand all the permutations. Okay. All right, um, we'll move into item uh, 16, items removed from the consent calendar. Mr. Herdman has pulled item number three. Uh, Mr. Herdman, would you like a staff report on this item? No, I don't need a staff report. Um, the reason I pulled it, uh, and, and I realize this is a second reading of this, uh, I should have been more on the ball with the first reading. I did reach out to some people in Newport Shores about the recommenda recommendation for making some of the streets one way. I discussed that with our city manager also on uh, Monday of uh, last week, right? And um, th there's recognizing that this, uh, these recommendations came from the uh, Homeowners Association over there. Um, I don't wanna throw a, a rock in the road or anything uh, to prevent this from happening, but there were some suggestions made that um, are counter to this or are not, or are, I don't wanna use the word in opposition to the recommendation, but there, there were some alternative recommendations. So um, I just wanna make sure that the community was uh, appropriately assessed on this recommendation, um, that our traffic department was involved in the decision as far as the recommendation for changing some streets to one way so I'm not quite sure how to proceed beyond that, but uh, Grace, you wanna? <laughs> why, don't, why don't we pull Mr. Webb up? Um, let's see, is Tony here? <laughs> no, okay, Mr. Webb, why don't you uh, speak to the community outreach on this item? Thank you. As I understand it, this um, item originated from the HOA of Newport Shores and brought forth. Um, we did do some community outreach. We talked to the hotel, which is right fronting uh, six, uh, 61st Street. They're okay with the circulation on this um, and the neighborhood on there. The segment that's being changed is it's just that one segment from Coast Highway to the first street, which is um, Coast Road, I believe. Um, we also reached out. We had a couple of follow-up uh, folks that you applied, uh, Mr. Herman, to, and uh, pointed them our way, and we've talked to him. One of them, a former council member, uh, Mr. Bryan, talked to him today, and he's now okay with the and understands the circulation element. Uh, I'm sorry, the photo in here, the attachment isn't real clear, but it, there is a way to get around that easily from Cappies. You have uh, 32nd Street, or I'm sorry, 60th Street. You can go just quickly around and go over to Prospect and out. So it's, it, we don't see a big circulation problem here. The traffic uh, folks support this. Um, and I think the biggest thing is that we should can try it. If we have see problems in the future, we can surely change it back. Recognize too that uh, part of that street is already one way, um, all the way down to Lancaster on 61st. Great, sounds good. Thank you, Dave. All right, any other discussion up here? All right, we'll go out to public comment. Do we have any public comment on this item? All right, do we have any calls? All right, we'll bring it back. Do we have a motion on this item? Yeah, I'll move approval. Second. Second by Mr. Avery. Uh, any discussion? All right, let's go ahead and vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-25, uh, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending section 12.52.060 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code to designate portions of streets as one-way traffic only. The motion carries unanimously, unanimously 7-0. All right, we'll go into uh, public comments on non-agenda items, uh, Madam Clerk. 
Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Spears must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. All right, we'll start in the community room. Do we have any public comments? Uh, what up, Council? My name is Chad Kroger. So, uh, yeah, the election is nigh. And uh, there's so much concern from citizens around voter fraud that we're worried that some homies aren't going to vote. Uh, so my dogs and I felt compelled to fix the ish. Through extensive surveying at the pier, we've compiled a list of who people are voting for, and we will now submit it to you so that it can be officially counted in the election. All right, here we go. Um, we got Gary Matalucci, he's voting for Trump. Uh, Linda Scroth and Sue Murd, both voting for Trump. Uh, the 11 squad, that's uh, Derek McArdle, Caleb Rich, Mike Kitzkowski, and Tanner Blansom, they're all going Trump. And then we got uh, Barry Morgan, he's voting for Joe Jorgensen. Uh, super interesting guy, he actually, he chiefs darts outside the rip curl shop a lot. Uh, he's pretty cool. Uh, then we got Laura Dial, who's uh, voting for Biden, but she's not a citizen, so uh, I'll let you guys make the call on that. All right, uh, JT's got more names later. What up, Council? My name is JT Parr. I want to thank all the citizens who voted with us. Their patriotism got me more fired up than Armageddon, the movie. I have more names I'd like to submit. Lucas Moore, he will be voting for Trump. He's a big tan dude who rides a beach cruiser. Dylan Marsuchowicz, Trump. Bill Sacco, Trump. Mike Creed, Trump. And then we had Dontrell Adams. He said he's going for Biden. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Friggin' good evening. My name's Strider Wilson. What up? Um, I wasn't able to cruise out to the beach with my bros the other day, because I was valeting at a bat mitzvah, but I was able to find out who everyone on my valet shift is voting for. They're as follows. Uh, Dave Reynolds and Biden. Uh, Clay Baxter, Trump. Uh, Adam Verisef, who in all honesty was a little bit baked when I asked him, so please don't grill him for that. Um, Biden. Eric S. Forgot his last name. I think it's Samuel Biden. Uh, Nico Sodanahe said he doesn't care. Uh, Kevin Baxter, who yes, is Kyle's twin brother, Biden. And um, my GF, who's the absolute dankest, Biden. Thank you, Late. All right. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is uh, Max Johnson, and uh, tonight I wanted to, uh, I was going to be speaking on short-term rentals, but I'm glad that, I'm glad that the ordinance passed. Um, something that has uh, come to my attention, as well as uh, my neighbors in District 1 and the uh, Peninsula Point community, is in the last few months, we've seen an increase in businesses that are operating like picnic um, businesses. So people that can order a service where this picnic venue can come out to our beaches and set up um, tables and umbrellas and provide champagne and charcuterie boards, et cetera. And so these businesses are operating um, without business permits in the city. So we've seen a huge increase in this. And so I do have photos I'll probably send to Diane, but neighbors and I have been concerned because we've only seen them weekend after weekend increase. So there's a local uh, company in Costa Mesa called The Picnic Collective, and that's an example of one of these businesses that uh, is, it's a great business model, uh, but they're coming down utilizing city beaches and providing alcohol um, in addition to food and uh, physical equipment on the beach for several hours without the necessary uh, permit. So I was hoping that staff can maybe follow up with this and um, see in you know, uh, other districts, including Corona del Mar, if that's been something that's been an issue, because I know we've seen it the last two to three months uh, skyrocket. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Okay, um, 
By the way, was anyone else disappointed Max didn't start out by saying, what up, council? Just, I'm just saying. Um, all right, uh, the, um, we'll go in the phones. Do we have any calls on the phones? All right, we'll bring it back. All right, we're gonna go into current business and uh, go to item number 14. Um, and uh, I know that we've got um, Harbor Commissioners here, so, uh, and it's a well-written staff report, so hopefully we do not have a terribly long um, presentation. Not anymore. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna- Mr. Uh, Mr. Duffield. I'm gonna recuse on this for business reasons. Uh, uh, Good enough. Recuse, yeah. All right. have some slides um, maybe like three slides <laughs> <laughs> pressure's on I'm gonna go fast well thank you very much uh, um, mayor and council members uh, I'm here I'm Kirk Worsting from the Harbor Department here on behalf of the Harbor Commission um, very brief background um, as all of you know last year the commission the Commission did a full cover-to-cover uh, -cover review of title 17 the Harbor Code um, it was adopted in large part in late January Council did request that one section related to liveaboards and commercial marinas be revisited. Unrelated to that, staff is asking council today to adopt a clarification regarding the public anchorage. As it pertains to liveaboards, liveaboards are very unique in, in, in the harbor community. They can serve as uh, eyes and ears of the harbor, uh, as, uh, as a neighborhood watch. It's also an area uh, where um, making sure that everybody has shared expectations is important and knowing uh, who is living in the harbor is the city's interest, um, as well as making sure that folks that are living on the water are being responsible with waste removal and, and that their vessels operate. Examples of why that's important. This year, for example, we were approached by the folks conducting the U.S. Census and being able to connect them with those liveaboard community members was a way that they um, could be represented in the counts. Um, picture here of a vessel that we would call a blue tarp special and that's the idea of maybe somebody who isn't clear about the expectations of uh, shared you know standards uh, property can be an issue with liveaboards because there's limited space and so this is an example of what can happen if you don't manage those standards uh, following the the direction from uh, the council to revisit the question public outreach was done as listed here we received feedback, and from that feedback, the council developed recommendations. Their recommendations primarily are to adjust the liveaboard definition so that it gives a lot of flexibility to the private marinas in determining how to best implement this type of liveaboard program so that they can benefit from the, uh, from the uh, neighborhood watch type program and the extra set of eyes and ears that I described earlier. Basically, the recommendations have no effect on offshore moorings where we have liveaboards, that, the, um, that there would be no limit placed on the liveaboards in the commercial marinas. There aren't a, a, an interest here to overregulate. There's, there's not um, a, a problem on that front. The private marinas are managing that themselves very well, and most of them are choosing not to have liveaboards at all, for example and uh, that liveaboard permitting w would be required, and that's a way for us to connect and know who is living in the marina and uh, as well as the offshore mooring fields that we can so we can address those issues of sanitation in the harbor and operability. Unrelated to the question on um, liveaboards in commercial marinas is the question regarding um, public anchorage. We're seeking clarification for use of the public anchorage on a 72 hour limit and 30-day period in certain circumstances where someone has a compelling case they can make a request to extend that period through written approval from my office the area that we're talking about here is a 4.8 acre space east of Lido Isle where folks will come and enjoy their time in, uh, on the water um, there's a second anchorage uh, in the open ocean where this three-day standard that we're proposing already exists um, this is one of the things we're looking to avoid. This uh, is a vessel that just this week broke anchor and ended up on the shores of Descanso Beach in Avalon. Um, unattended vessels are vessels that can be more dangerous. Um, 
establishing the 72 hour standard is consistent with what we're doing in the open ocean anchorage off Corona Del Mar. Uh, the thinking is that it improves safe use of the anchorage. Now someone could make the case that, well, gosh, it's a, it's a protected harbor. It's less dangerous than the open ocean. That has not been my experience in the past two years. We have a lot of users in the anchorage within the harbor that drag anchor. And if the, those vessels are unattended, um, they can end up in navigation lanes and, and can create tr quite a problem uh, for other boaters. It also has the potential to improve shared use of the anchorage. We've learned um, in the last several years that it's a very popular harbor amenity. There are many days during the boating season where the anchorage is at full capacity. And so by limiting uh, monthly stays to 72 hours, it makes the space available for more members of the public. We also have some unique um, geography in Newport Harbor where this anchorage is located very near residential homes and that factor needs to be considered. And then we're also very fortunate that Newport Harbor has a unique set of other offerings. So boaters that wish to extend their stays can um, rent available moorings at a very affordable rate, visit the uh, Marina Park Marina. Um, and as was previously said, if they have a compelling reason, they can make a request to extend beyond the three-day maximum. And so thank you very much. And there are members of the Harbor Commission, Commissioner uh, Yon and Chairman Kenny, who are here. Um, who can answer any additional questions you may have as well. All right, hang on just a moment. Ms. Dixon, go ahead. Uh, th uh, th thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm pleased that it looks like the Harbor Commission and the uh, commercial uh, marina operators would, were able to work something out. Um, I really have an open question about, well, a question regarding open items uh, that have been directed by the council. I, I'm just going on my memory. Weren't, uh, wasn't the Harbor Commission still going to be looking at marine activity permits, or what is the status of that? That's really my question. That, that's correct. That will um, come back to you at a later date, but we're looking at uh, marine activities permits as well, and that program allows our department to really have direct engagement with the business community that operates in the harbor. Um, we've done a great job building relationships with the commercial uh, fleet operations, but there's opportunities for us to expand expand into service providers, folks that do everything from remove waste material to deliver fuel on the harbor, and the marine activities permits uh, will allow us to do that. So is that a, is there a current subcommittee looking at that? That actually just went through um, commission and will be coming to you at a later date. Oh, very good. Okay, and one other item on the temporary uh, permits, three days to are the rules regarding waste and how they dispose of waste, is that all enforced within that three-day period? That's correct. So one of the changes that happened as part of the Title 17 reviews is um, giving our office the authorization to um, uh, deposit dye tablets into vessels holding tanks so that, uh, it, and, and it's an educational process to remind folks not to dump in the harbor. And if they were to after the deposit of that tank, an iridescent appears, and so it's very clear that they cheated. Um, with the COVID and the distancing, that's area that we have delayed on implementation just for safety of staff, but we do intend to continue to build that out as, as, uh, as improvements um, on the COVID front take place. And the, it's already there in the code, so we'll be able to, to have additional monitoring. Of, you could uh, board up, you could board up. Okay. And so we still are gonna, of course, request boarding someone's yes. boat. People have Fourth Amendment rights. They can deny the government from boarding their property, but they don't have that right to stay in Newport Harbor. So if they choose not to, um, mm -hmm. to allow us to board their boat and deposit that die tab, we'll graciously invite them on to their next port of call. Very good. All right, thank you. Very good job. Thank you. All right, do we have any other? Mr. Muldoon and then Mr. Avery. Uh, just, just to clarify, um, if this is if someone is docked at the marina and they sign an agreement with the marina to be a tenant, they submit to a, to a search if they want to continue staying there? No, well, I think that's a big, bit of a, a mixed topic. So um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Dixon had shifted to, to uh, just how we manage the anchorage in terms of the sanitation standard. What's being proposed with the commercial marinas is if they identify someone who is residing within their marina, that we would be able to engage with them not only on the sanitation standard, but the operational standard of their vessel as well, and know who they are so that we know who's living on the harbor in the event of an emergency, for example. But I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is someone who's 
simply traversing through the harbor is not going to be boarded and asked to do a, a dive tap. Correct. That's correct. It's someone who is voluntarily using the coastal tile lands that fall under the purview of the City of Perth Tile Lands Trust and are essentially a tenant. So examples would be a permittee on the offshore moorings, uh, a user of the anchorage for a period of time, a, a sub-permittee that's using the, the offshore moorings for a short period of time as a traveling mariner. And Those would all be examples where we would be able to educate them about the standards. Very, very typical in, in, in other uh, ports of call. So you do, if you go to Avalon, for example, they'll do the exact same thing. Yes, and if... This, if the boater decides that they do not want their, bo their boat boarded or they don't want to submit, then they have to essentially leave that location. That's correct. And that, uh, re that privilege is revoked, essentially. Thank you. Mr. Avery. Yeah, I have a couple questions for uh, Chair Kenny. First is a statement. Uh, uh, just thanking you and Commissioner Yon for taking it on and, and doing a great job of bringing this forward. And uh, I think it's it's really well done. And I know you had some back and forth. And, um, I, uh, I, and I especially like the fact that we're letting the marinas figure out the liveaboard uh, numbers and management on their own. We don't need to be doing that. I think uh, we, we know our marinas in town and we know they're, they're well managed and uh, they watch that, so it's great. So it's less work for us. We let them do it. It's good for everybody, so I appreciate that. But how long have you been working on this? Um, Honorable Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, specifically um, Vice Chair Avery, who knows this very well, uh, it's been a two-year process. Right. And I want to do reiterate, uh, we worked closely with the marine operators. Nothing in what was passed on January 28th, nothing that is being proposed this evening would put any restrictions on a commercial marina operator. Right, good. Uh, and we did remove the limitation on the number of liveaboards that would be allowed in a commercial marina. So the commercial marina operators are free to set their own limits. All we're doing is leveling the playing field between a liveaboard that is on an offshore mooring and a liveaboard that is in a commercial marina. Um, part of this, as Harbormaster Borstring mentioned, is the fact that these people spend much more time on their vessels. They need to be held to a higher standard, but for their own safety and security, we need to know who they are and where they are, just as we do with the offshore uh, mooring permittees. So all we're doing is creating parity, and we appreciate uh, you know, your uh, comments. Uh, we did have three public hearings on this, and we got some good feedback, and we've come back with what we hope is a uh, an equitable solution for everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your service. Two years. Bring it in. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions from the dais? All right. Seeing none, we'll uh, go out to the public comment at this time. Do we have any public comment in the community room? Yes, you do. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, this is Jim Mosier. Uh, with all due respect to the Harbor Commission Committee and their hard work on this. I do not believe this ordinance is ready for introduction tonight. It's rather like the Measure to Z that voters are contemplating on the November 3rd ballot. This is, as it stands tonight, poorly written law that doesn't do what it claims to do, speaking of the liveaboard part. And the biggest problem with it that I see is the definition of liveaboard, which you can find on page 14-5. It formerly attempted to define in general what living aboard meant, but now it has become so specific that the only way a person can be regarded and enforced as a liveaboard is if they're either on a mooring or in a commercial marina. On any other kind of vessel in the harbor, apparently you can do whatever you want. That is, I think, a problem. And then the other part of this, if you were listening carefully, after telling you about the liveaboard part, 
Harbor Master Borsting said, and unrelated to this, we're presenting to you some changes to the rules about anchorages. However, the title of the ordinance is telling the public that it's about the Liverboard chapter and other related provisions. And the agenda says that too. So there is a real problem presenting a ordinance that says it's about liverboards and related provisions when it contains unrelated provisions and those unrelated provisions are perhaps not well thought out. You had, I see some comments that were received from Mr. Wade Womack this afternoon. He is pointing out that the new regulation on people staying in the anchorage probably was intended to make sure that boats are not left unattended for more than three hours. However, as written, it says that you cannot leave the boat for more than three hours in an entire day. So a person visiting our harbor, expecting it to be a nice wel welcoming harbor, cannot leave their boat at the anchorage for a half hour at one time during the day and a half hour at another time during the day. They're only allowed to leave for one period of three hours or less one time a day. As I understand, that's what the unrelated provisions that you would be enacting say. Mr. Womack is also suggesting that the 72 hours, which was invented to apply to limit boats staying unattended in, at Corona Del Mar State Beach, should perhaps more appropriately be five days that people are allowed to stay. I think both of those deserve um, consideration, and I believe the ordinance needs to explain that it's changing anchorage rules as well as liveaboard rules. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments in the community room? All right, do we have any calls? All right, I'll take the call. I right, go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Mike Glenn. I, uh, excuse me, I was just getting caught up on the subject when I uh, tuned in here, so I apologize if I missed something that's already been covered. Um, one of the gentlemen said that it was of high importance that we know who is using our harbor. Now, I don't understand why that would be true. Why we don't need to know who is in a long-term rental. We don't, while we can find out, we don't, necessarily need to know who owns a home we don't need to know who owns boats why do we need to know who's on the boat this doesn't make any sense to me and it seems like a tremendous tremendous intrusion by government thank you thank you do we have any other calls okay we'll bring it back um Mr. Kenny, would you like to respond to the public comment because i think he was, re he was referencing your comment about knowing Who's, who's on board? Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Mayor O'Neill, members of the City Council. I think what Mr. Glenn was referring to is the Harbor Department wanting to know who is actually living aboard their boat. No one cares who comes into the harbor, uh, whether they come in for an hour or for 72 hours in the anchorage or for weeks at a time. The key is those who are actually spending most of their time on the boats. They are the ones that we need to know who they are and where they are, really for their own safety and security. That was the intent of my comment. All right, appreciate that. Uh, hang on just one second, Ms. Brenner. I was just gonna make that point that it seems like for public safety reasons, it would be really important for us to know if there are people living on various boats. All right, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, Harbor commissioners don't speak for the city or staff. I appreciate the attention given this matter. I don't agree that we have to know who lives on these boats or who is on a boat in a harbor. I, I tend to agree with Mr. Glenn's concerns. I do think that there is a public health benefit to knowing what's going in the harbor, which is why I'm supporting this item. But I just want to state um, it's just a difference of philosophy. It doesn't mean that uh, what Mr. Kenny is saying is not valid, but it does mean it's not the position of of the city or the council necessarily. The, the position is to protect harbor from pollutants that are um, released from uh, you know, these vessels. And if we want to drain the swamp, which we do want to do, that we, we need this kind of um, uh, insurance to make sure that our, our bay is clean. Um, I, I do think it's important though, because um, 
I, I share Mr. Glenn's skepticism about government. Thank you. All right. Do we have any um, any other discussion, or do we have a motion? Move that. Moved by Mr. Avery. Do we have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Herdman. Any discussion? All right. Let's go ahead and vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-27, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending Chapter 17.40 and Title 17 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code and other re related provisions with Council Member Duffield recusing, recusing himself. The motion carries 6-0. All right. We'll wait a second for Mr. Duffield to come back in. Oh, there you go. All right, we'll move into item number 15, an update on homeless strategies. Um, we'll be, okay, we'll go to Ms. Jacobs first. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Natalie Basmaja and I'm your homeless coordinator. Uh, we last presented our homeless update strategy in March of 2020, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have updates since this uh, pandemic began. Uh, the first thing to note is we've had great continuity of service with our city net providers and case managers. We've had the same case managers this entire time, which has made a big difference for us. Um, to back up a bit, we did our point in time count in January of 2019. That is a federally mandated uh, process we go through. During that process, we identified 65 to 80 people experiencing homelessness in Newport Beach on any given night in that uh, time count frame. Um, the numbers may fluctuate based on shelter bed availability, family situations, and also weather conditions, among other factors. Um, so we work from that 65 to 80 number. Um, since that point in time count, we have housed and sheltered 55 people. Um, and again, please note, those might not be the same 55 people from that pool of people we had. Some people might find their own accommodations, somebody else might start experiencing homelessness, but it's a working number that we've been using. Our next, <clears throat> excuse me, point in time count is scheduled for January 25th, 2021. That is an opportunity for community members to volunteer to go out with our teams and actually work overnight to identify people experiencing homelessness on those specific nights. When COVID-19, uh, when the pandemic began, our governor announced a program called Project Room Key. This was a motel program to shelter vulnerable people that might be older or they have health conditions, they would be more uh, prone to contracting COVID-19. Um, this program was funded by FEMA for 75% of the costs and by the state of California for 25% of the costs. The city did not pay anything to participate. Uh, we were able to house 33 people through Project Room Key and some of the people have gone on to other better living arrangements. Um, some of the people reunified with their family members having, after having a place to stabilize and assess their situations. Um, and the people that are still in Project Room Key are working with the CityNet case managers to prepare all of their documentation while again, they're stable and sheltered um, to be able to prepare them for their next housing opportunity. Um, Project Room Key officially closed for entry on September 30th. Anyone who was in the program before the 30th has ongoing case management and they also have, um, they're, they're still being housed in the motels, but they're not taking anybody new. Um, in addition to Project Room Key, uh, we've taken other city actions since September, uh, January of 2019. Uh, we have added no panhandling signs slash good giving signs at key intersections in the city. Um, we have formed a weekly team with our city net case managers, um, again, for the continuity of service, a familiar face when we're out in the field. Um, we've also hosted six community programs regarding homelessness on various topics. And we've also formed our rapid response team, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, 
And finally, we've worked with uh, Orange County Transportation Authority um, to improve the conditions and the enforcement at the Newport Transportation Center. Uh, on the police department side, uh, we now have a new homeless liaison officer, Cynthia Carter. Uh, she took the position when Tony Yim promoted to sergeant in May of 2020. She immediately hit the ground in all of our hot spots to find out who our people in need were, uh, to find out where they were in their city net case management, and she has been a part of our rapid response team. Um, when we deploy as a rapid response team, we go out with employees from various departments, such as public works, police, fire, park patrol, and the OASIS Senior Center. Uh, we're able to provide an array of services. Um, our Susie at OASIS can go into a discussion about how to apply for Social Security benefits, um, what services OASIS offers for seniors. Um, we've offered medical aid in the field and also bus passes if people had a plan to reunify with family or return to their city of origin. Um, with that, we've, when we go out as a rapid response team, uh, we're assessing the conditions, we're making sure that people know the curfews and ordinances where they're setting up. We'll ask them to discard any refuse. Uh, we'll ask them to tidy up their belongings and, of course, find out what they need and how we can offer assistance. Uh, in this time period, we've had several success stories. Uh, we have a man named Jason who grew up in Newport Beach. Uh, he was homeless for six years due to alcoholism and just general despondency. I've known him a long time. And he entered Project Room Key and then transitioned into a two-week medical detoxification to address his alcoholism. He is now housed in a sober living facility paying his own monthly rent. He attends all of his meetings every day. He got his old full-time job back, and as of yesterday, he got his first driver's license in six years. So he is on his path. Uh, we had a homeless veteran staying by the Balboa Pier for three years. Uh, honorably discharged, he is now housed in the new Heroes Landing uh, Veteran Support Village in Santa Ana. He's doing very well. He moved in in July of 2020. There was a bit of a delay when they were using their COVID protocols to be able to move in almost 75 units of housing. And then finally, we uh, have housed four families during this time. Um, one of them of note, the head of household was a quadriplegic mother with two minor children and an adult child, and the four of them were living in a van and sleeping in various locations throughout the city. Um, they were doing that for about three weeks before we were able to connect them with CityNet and then fast track them into proper housing. Um, we do field uh, concerns from residents. When we field those, usually in an email, I will go out and check first to see what the situation is. Is it somebody we know? Is it somebody new? Is it somebody we know who's in a different part of town? Um, and then once I do that, I can decide when to involve the police. Um, do I need an officer for enforcement or do I need Officer Carter to assist me? And then we can also um, pull CityNet in at that point to offer the full array of services and resources. Um, it is very frustrating for residents. Uh, to see people in distress, you know, living their lives publicly. Um, I know there's an anger factor, and we do our best to work with everybody and make sure that their dignity is maintained while we're going through this very complicated, long process trying to re reintroduce them into a better way of living. Um, and that's where CityNet plays the key role, that they have the connections and the referrals to help us do that. Um, there are certain actions we cannot take as an employee. Um, we cannot monitor people if they're using parks, beaches, and piers as intended during general use hours. Uh, we cannot ask people to just leave the city. Um, we cannot have people not tell people they can't panhandle. That's a protected First Amendment right to speech. Uh, we cannot tell people they must wake up if they're sleeping in a public place. We do not have uh, municipal code ordinance to enforce that. Um, and we also cannot assume people are homeless. I have people that sheep sleep in Laguna Beach in their shelter. They come to Newport Beach to use our services or go to appointments, and then they might have mail service at uh, share ourselves in Costa Mesa. Um, 
the best way that we've been keeping the city and the residents informed is through Grace's Week in Review articles that come out every Friday afternoon. Uh, we do put our success stories in there every week. Um, it could be as simple as somebody getting their ID to somebody finally being housed. Um, moving forward, uh, we have some um, items and works. Uh, one is a temporary shelter update. Uh, Grace is working with the city of Costa Mesa with a memorandum of understanding uh, to try and uh, partner regionally for a shelter solution. Given our low number of homeless people in the city, um, it would be more cost effective than running our own shelter. Um, we'd be able to leverage resources with another city better. And to be honest, we're serving some of the same people, so we would be able to avoid uh, duplicating costs and efforts for the same person who's in both cities. Um, we'd also be more competitive to obtain state and federal grants through regional partnerships. Um, there's an anticipated MOU discussion for the city council um, on November 10th. And finally, um, for permanent supportive housing, we're looking uh, to interview developers for that project on November 10th. Uh, we put in a request for qualifications to build 50, up to 50 units of supportive housing in the city. Uh, so we will have those interview results ready for uh, city council consideration in early 2021. Uh, we are also working on a consideration for community development block grant funding through the CARES Act to um, shelter people in motels and then again work with CityNet to get them into a better situation. That's the end of the report, thank you. Thank you. Any other report on that? Okay. Um, Council, do you have any questions or comments? Um, I'll go uh, Ms. Dixon first, Mr. Avery, I'm sorry, Ms. Brenner, and then, all right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, excellent, you've been working hard on this and, and a lot of good information. I. Uh, I want to talk about the peer. You see the same emails that I get, and I refer them to you, so thank you for handling. Uh, there seems to be greater numbers of homeless at the peer. Uh, could you talk about the peer situation, and uh, is it becoming a greater challenge, or how are we dealing with it? Over the summer, there was a slight uptick in people being there. Um, part of it is there are very few activities to do right now, the beach being one of them. For a time period, OCTA was offering free bus fare, and that was allowing people to just come and explore and ride the bus to their destination, which happened to be the piers. Um, and then there is a slight uptick in people that are struggling right now. Um, I was on a county call this morning, and as a county, which also bears true in Newport Beach, uh, people are experiencing homelessness in a less, less of a time frame, which is an optimistic way to view this. Um, we don't have the 30, 20, 10-year chronic homeless people. Um, we're trying to get to people before this becomes a new way of life and before this becomes an issue in the city where it's unsightly and people are living here in conditions that are not suitable. Um, is there any way to estimate how many people are still living in their cars in our city? That's hard to determine, um, even from a police standpoint. Um, we don't know if somebody is just taking a nap or if they're there overnight. Um, if we find out that people are in their cars or they indicate to us they don't want to live in their car anymore, then we, we offer all the services and, and get them out of that situation. And you also mentioned something about waking. We don't have provision in our municipal code to enforce people who are sleeping in the public space and to wake them. Is that something other cities have? I don't know offhand which cities may or may not have that. But do, is that something we're lacking in that we need to have that? In, no? Okay. That, that provision to allow you to that would That would be incredibly difficult to enforce. Somebody takes a nap on the beach and we got to, I mean, that would. All right, I just didn't understand her comment that we don't have it in our code, so I didn't. Well, I think, I think some, of the, the, some of the issues, we get, we get citizen complaints about that kind of activity. Somebody's sleeping on a park bench. That's, that's not an illegal activity. Um, if they were awake on the park bench, again, that's not an illegal activity right. during normal business hours, and that was just another example of things we're not enforcing, nor because probably we, should. 
Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your good work. It's, it's been remarkable. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Natalie, can you tell us um, what our anticipated date might be as far as the shelter goes? What are they what are they saying as far as when that will be completed and when we would be able to have access to beds? And, and also what that means as far as how our process will change when we have that. Councilmember Brenner, I'm gonna go ahead and take that okay. one for you if you don't mind. Um, so we had, I listened to a Costa Mesa study session several weeks ago and they are anticipating the opening of the shelter in March of 2021. So if we can get our agreement in place, that's when they anticipate the shelter to be open. Um, at that point, we would have beds available, so we would allow, you know, that, becomes, that becomes something we can offer immediately, right? We've got 20 beds, and so now we can begin to offer folks things. We can begin to offer them shelter. Um, we can begin to um, strongly, more strongly suggest that they come to the shelter with us as opposed to sleeping in public spaces, and that's been one of the concerns of the community. Um, I'm going to have to say this, it's not, this is not the cure-all, end-all, be-all of um, this is not the cure for homelessness. A permanent home is the cure for the homelessness and getting them that support, permanent supportive housing that we're working on as well. Um, but we will be able to enforce the anti-camping laws a little bit uh, more strongly, be able to get people into shelter, which puts them in the process to get them permanent housing. And that's really what, what the shelter is for. Okay, uh, the, um, other question. Um, we know the bus was a part of the problem. They were dropping people off here, but now because of COVID, are we seeing an uptick in the number of people that are becoming homeless or on the verge of homeless? We have had a few people that are now homeless. Um, I met a young couple last week. They both are employed. Um, they couldn't pay their rent anymore because of job loss prior to them being employed now. And they can't move in with a set of parents because it would compromise the parents' rent and housing. Um, so they are determined to get back on their feet. They are working with CityNet as hard as they can. Um, they've already budgeted for a security deposit, but it was a COVID-19 related job loss that led them here. Um, the boyfriend is actually employed in Newport Beach with a yachting company and that's why he decided at least he can be close to work and be reliable and go to his shifts so he doesn't prolong his situation. So as we develop affordable housing units in some of the, we're talking about housing, how does someone like that become connected to these units that we will know are available? Some of that will be determined by um, income status um, connections to the city of Newport Beach, and in his case, he's employed in the city and has been. Um, it might be other factors, um, depending on what the supportive housing model looks like. If it's geared for senior citizens or military veterans, that might preclude whether or not somebody would qualify. Thank you. And the only other thing I wanted to mention is that we talk a lot in our homeless um, committee meetings about the options for people to donate to those who are less fortunate and are trying to get um, on their feet. So do we have a slide about that? We, I was contacted by a school board member today who told me that we have about 300 children in the Newport Mesa School District who are either homeless or on the brink of homelessness. So there's an opportunity to help in that regard. I know um, serving people in need works with families that are either experiencing home or on the brink. If they see someone, a family that's just about to lose their accommodations, they will work with them to help them keep from them becoming homeless. And so, um, okay, so this is some of the, I don't see it down here on mine, but these are some of the organizations that with whom we work and um, who are helping out. We've got a lot of people in our community that are working with these various organizations and uh, it's always encouraging to me when I talk to these people who are actively working to solve the homeless situation. So we just wanna make sure that everyone knows that there are opportunities to really be part of the solution and help some of these families that are experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Herdman. Yeah, Natalie, just real quick, what did you say about the use of, uh, additional use of CARES Act money? 
uh, we're considering a proposal to basically do our own version of Project Room Key, uh, where we would identify individuals that would have a good success rate having that managed care uh, with the goal of moving them into a permanent living situation, wherever that may be. Um, we're still putting together numbers and proposals, and I'll defer to Carol on the rest of that. So, and that's coming from the county? That would you be applying to the uh, to the county for that? I believe, believe that's additional CDBG money from the feds. Ah, okay, very good. So you, you've been notified that those funds are available for some kind of creative program. Yes, and, and internally we're working on putting together a program that we can present to the council. Great, thank you. Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Just another question. I know, Natalie, and as, when, since you've been involved in this process now for over a year, or maybe, yeah, um, we're keeping really good records and tracking the situation, how many of the homeless that we've been dealing with are, or what percentage of the homeless are Newport Beach residents and what percentage are not? At this point, I would say at least half are Newport, like they have deep ties here, whether it was employment or they graduated from Corona Del Mar High School, mm -hmm. um, they had long-term employment in the city, it's, it's at least half. Um, the other half might have had something going on in the city and lost that opportunity and now they're here um, and that's what's very tricky to try and figure out is at what point do we say they're a Newport Beach resident? Um, is it length of time in the city? Is it employment? Is it having their doctor's appointments here? Um, we, we still are trying to drill down on what that would really mean. So if they are residents of, are we, we determine that they are residents of another city or state, what's the process? At that point, we try to find out if there's a viable option to reunify with family. Uh, we've been successful doing that uh, in, in the county, in the state, and even out of state. Um, at that point, you know, it, it, the person still has some free will in these discussions. It might not be family they want to reunify with. So at that point, CityNet does a lot of uh, phone calls. Officer Carter calls the families to find out if that's a viable option to reunify people. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, I'll jump in real quickly and just say that it's a, it's rather extraordinary the, di the difference in the place we are now versus where we were a year and a half ago. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that, but I would suggest that probably the number one reason um, was Grace's decision to move Natalie over and, and be the homelessness liaison coordinator for our entire city. Um, for those of you who don't know, Natalie was the employee of the year uh, this year, which was... I, I swear, th two or three weeks feels like a year right now. So I, I think it was two or three weeks ago. Um, but Natalie was uh, named as by her peers and colleagues as the employee of the year for the city of Newport Beach. Um, Natalie, it's, the work that you're doing is, is I mean, it's a godsend. Um, and so I appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, and I think that we also know that the tenor in our community has changed also. A lot of the discussion, a lot of the frustration, a lot of the anger um, has dissipated. The frustration's still there. And we should be frustrated. Um, it's right to be frustrated to see uh, fellow humans that are sleeping on the street or sleeping out, outdoors. Um, we are right to be frustrated. And so there are, as uh, Ms. Brenner pointed out, a number of opportunities, both public and private, to make a difference. And so it's, uh, it's been, we, have, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and I think the entire state, frankly, has a really long way to go. Uh, but the, uh, the efforts made here greatly appreciated, so I appreciate the ongoing efforts. Um, and then we'll go to Mr. Avery real quickly. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you also, and, uh, and Carol has put a lot of time in this, I know. And, uh, you know, we're a great city, but I, I think uh, really this is, this program and taking care of uh, people who are really struggling, that's what really makes us a great city, that we're able to do this, and we do it well, and we're, we're Getting on, a, it was very rough going in the beginning, and we're really getting on solid footing. I feel, and we certainly have a plan for going forward, as you described, and uh, and I think all the residents should be proud of it. And uh, we're we're solving problems, but um, you know, it, within the city and for people, residents. But really, uh, it's exceptional that we're, I believe, we're saving lives, and we're we're just doing so much to help individuals that are in such crisis. 
it's so important, I think, to uh, recognize it and understand that that's a crucial part of why we're such a great city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, any other discussion up here? All right, we'll go out to public comment. We'll start in the community room. Do we have any public comment in the community room? That looks like a very empty community room. All right, uh, we'll uh, bring it back. Do we have any calls? No. All right, uh, again, I'll just echo thank you. We still have a long way to go, but uh, the progress made is admirable, especially in a year like this. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Carol. All right, we'll move into item number 16, coronavirus update by um, our city manager. And uh, I'll just quickly preview, actually, Madam Clerk, I'm just going to ask at the very end of this that you let everyone know um, voting options this year. Just in, I, I've gotten a handful of questions from people: Are they whether they're able to vote in person uh, because of COVID? So I just and you know what kind of um, precautions are being taken for in-person voting? So uh, just preview that for you at the very end. So we'll start with our city manager. Okay, and um, this will be actually fairly brief. I don't have a lot to update, uh, largely because we're uh, fairly static right now um, in where we are on metric side. So just real briefly, you know that there are four tiers according to um, the state that's been laid out of where we can be, um, that lays out the risk-wise and then accordingly what we can and can't have open. And we are in the red tier. Um, and this gives us a trend for the last several weeks now for Orange County. And you can see it's fairly steady kind of is up and then ticks down, ticks up a little bit. Um, and really with that positivity um, rate is, is, a, is a good one. That actually would, just on that, we're in the orange tier, which is the um, next to last, uh, you know, least, um, least transmission level. But the case per 100,000 has, um, has stayed at a level that's in that red tier. And that puts us in, um, continues us into that red tier. Um, and we've been in that red tier for about eight weeks now. The health equity metric that most recently has come on board, um, looking at the lowest court trial in the county and what the, the um, positivity rate is there, it is still on the high side. We really, um, that needs to be down um, below 5.3%, uh, um, and right now it's at six. Um, and I think the important thing to remember and what the county has really emphasized with us is that our neighboring counties here are largely in the red, um, or purple tier, which is the, the worst tier to be in in our surrounding area. And to the extent that we have people who either work um, or live in other counties, you know, we are going to be impacted. So the general thought from the county is that with the other tiers, particularly um, Riverside moved into the purple, uh, the worst tier uh, recently. Um, Los Angeles continues to be in purple. San Diego is in red. San Bernardino is Barely. in purple. Huh? Yeah, San Diego's barely in the red. Barely, yeah, they're yeah. they're they've been on edge with on being in purple, um, and with that, that it's going to be challenging for us to move out of red into orange, um, just given the you know the regional uh, nature there. So I, I think we're we're in this red tier um, right now for for the foreseeable future um, right now, um, and really that that's my main um, update for today. I don't have a yeah. anything it's, else on that. It's worth pointing out real quickly just mm -hmm. the. That four point, the difference between that 4.6 and the 5.1 is in our county is the equivalent of about 16 additional people per day in a county of 3.2 million people. So that just when you're when you're trying to figure out what these numbers mean, that's how that's the difference. It's about 16 people out of a county of 3.2 million people testing positive. So uh, per day, just to be clear, over a seven day average. Uh, Ms. Brenner. I forgot to mention earlier that um, last night the library did a lecture and it's part of their Medicine in Our Backyard series and the speaker, this is recorded, the reason I'm telling this is that people can go and watch this recording. The speaker was Dr. Thomas Cesario from UCI who is a, he used to be the dean of the College of Medicine but he is a world famous infectious disease specialist. And so I think it's, um, I only heard part of it, but I'm definitely going to go back and listen to that because Tom is just a really common sense, good physician. And I think it would be helpful for people to, um, to listen to his remarks. Thank you. Um, my last comment on this slide also, you can actually see by zip code in the city of Newport Beach how each zip code has been doing on these metrics week by week. If you go to the Orange County Health website, go to the COVID dashboard, and then click on Confirm Cases by Zip Map, um, you will be able to see uh, cases 
per 100,000 in positivity rate. My only recommendation would be to keep in mind the population of each of those. So for example, if you have one person test positive in a week on Balboa Island, um, that would actually, the case rate's right around five. So it's probably just, it's worth remembering the, uh, to take into account population. Um, all right, Madam Clerk, could you speak real quickly to um, voting uh, methods? I know we, we can vote by mail and we've got our, our big yellow ballot boxes um, around, but uh, could you also speak to uh, voting in person when, where, and what are the protocols? The vote centers throughout Orange County will be begin opening on Friday the 30th at 7 a.m. and then they close on November 3rd, which is election day at 8 p.m. The drop boxes are open 24 hours, seven days a week. We are needing to close four of those that are in the fire area. The vote centers for Newport Beach um, are located at Coastline College, Marina Park Community Center, the Civic Center, the um, Newport Coast Community Center, Oasis Senior Center, and Newport Harbor Lutheran Church. Anyone in Orange County can vote at any of the vote centers. They can turn in their mail-in ballot at any of the ballot drop boxes within your own county. Um, there are, they, the county is having COVID protocols. Um, if you do decide to go to a vote center, everyone will be masked. Um, you will get your own pen. All the stations will be six feet apart. Um, if you see here outside of, um, in our parking lot, there's a pod. Those are some of the equipment that the Registrar of Voters Office will be using. Um, any other? Oh, and on the city's website, newportbeachca.gov slash 2020 election, you can find the vote center locations. Um, it also links you back to the OC vote, which is the Registrar of Voters Office, where you can track your ballot um, if you want to become a vote center worker, which might be a little bit too late, but also um, getting more information about locations for vote centers and drop boxes throughout Orange County. Fantastic. So if you have any follow-up questions, go to ocvote.com. Yeah, Ms. Dixon. Yeah, Ms. Dixon. Um, just to also add to what uh, Madam Clerk just said, for anyone who's already voted, uh, you can go to the ocregistrarvoters.com and do ballot tracking, and you can see if your ballot has arrived, and it will tell you uh, if it has, indeed. So it's a real good opportunity to track your ballot. Correct, and also on that 2020 election website, there's a video by the Registrar of Voter, Neil Kelly, about how they're setting up the vote centers if anyone has concerns. All right, thank you very much. All right, we'll move into a motion for reconsideration. Madam Clerk. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council, either this meeting or the previous meeting, may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. Do we have any motions for reconsideration? All right, tonight we're gonna to be adjourning in memory of John Starr. Um, Council Member Dixon will uh, read the adjournment. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Longtime Newport Beach community leader John Starr passed away on October 14th. John was born in Fort Dodge, Iowa in 1932 and attended Stanford University on a Naval ROTT, ROTC scholarship. He joined the Navy after graduation and upon completing his service, enrolled in Harvard Law School. After graduating from Harvard, John joined the law firm of Blatham & Watkins in Los Angeles. He and his wife Elizabeth settled in the city of Arcadia. In the early 1970s, John and another Latham partner opened the firm's Orange County office, a move that thankfully brought the Starr family to Newport Beach. John and Elizabeth's children attended local schools and the Starr's, Starr's became highly involved in supporting various charitable and nonprofit causes. After John retired from practicing law in 1996, he devoted even more time to nonprofit groups, primarily with the Pacific Symphony, South Coast Repertory, Pacific Corral, UC Irvine, and uh, Arts Orange County. He also served on the boards for national organizations such as the Hoover Institution. John and Elizabeth were integral figures in the creation of our Newport Beach Central Library. They initiated a grassroots fundraising campaign that began in 1989 with the creation of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. The goal of the campaign was to raise $1.5 million. It ended up raising more than $2 million, most of which came from smaller individual donations from the community as opposed to large corporate gifts. The Library Foundation that John and Elizabeth helped establish 
continues to fund exceptional collections, programs, and resources for our library today. We would not have the Central Library today were it not for the STARS leadership and support. And in fact, this evening, we received an, another uh, one of the $7 million in contribution that the foundation has raised for the city, uh, our city library. John and Elizabeth were honored by the UCI Medal receiving the UCI medal in 2003 and with the Newport Beach Citizen of the Year Award as a couple in 2016. John is survived by Elizabeth, their four children, and five grandchildren. A memorial service will be held at St. James Episcopal Church on a date to be announced. Thank you. Thank you. We stand adjourned.